This session is on stranded assets. Uh, my name is Roberto Schaefer, a professor from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. I'm going to be your moderator today. We have five presentations. The idea is to have, let's say, 10 minutes for each presentation. And the session on total has 75 minutes. So the idea is to keep at least 20 minutes for discussions. And so let me introduce you for the first, the first present presenter, which is Alexandre Scro, who happened to be from my institution, from the Federal University of Rio. Uh, so Alexandre, you have 10 minutes to, to, to make your presentation. In fact, I just touched your presentation and we came to an end here. Okay, Alexandre, the floor is yours. 10 minutes, please. So thank you, Roberto. Good morning. And um, just to remember, good year for all, a sweet year for all. Today is new year for my family. Um, I'm going to present some results of our analysis. These are results that come from a paper that we recently pub published. And the name of my presentation is Stranded Crude Oil Resources and Refineries Carbon Lock-In. Why do climate ambitions, crude oil quality and refineries matter? Um, our major hypothesis here is to show that we have to uh, represent the oil quality and the typology of refineries in order to have a better picture of the stranded assets. And, by, and to prove this hypothesis, we have run our integrated assessment model, our global integrated assessment model. The name of this integrated assessment model is COFFEE. This is a partial equilibrium integrated assessment model that runs both the food system and the energy system for 18 regions in the world. So we have a objective function that is minimize the cost for supplying the energy service for 18 regions in the world and also the food demand for the 18 regions of the world. To do that, we have the land use system representation and the energy system representation for these regions. This is our methodology, but I have to skip to go fast. This is, yeah, sorry, I can answer the questions later. These are the 18 regions represented in the model, but it's important to say that we have to run together the land use system to have the representation for the all GAG emissions, not only CO2, but also GAG emissions from deforestation and also from the agriculture and pasture activities. So I'm going to skip the results. It's important to say here, it's not so easy to read, so we're going to do that. Um, first of all, we have run our model without expressing the oil quality and the typologies of refineries. And then we have run our model with the oil model on, switching on the oil model in order to show if it's important or not to represent the properties of the oil. It's different to see if you have the stranded resources, for example, with have crudes, acid crudes. The oil refiners are not all prepared to process this type of crude. So they may, they need to invest, to revamp, to have some investment in order to be prepared to process this type of crude. So by running our model, the oil model on and off, we were able to see if it is important, this is important. And is somehow important for some regions in the world for South America because of the Venezuelan crude oil and also for the Canadian crude oil, this is important. These are the regions that should not produce oil because of the quality of the oil. For this remaining oil production, these are not the winner regions. But for the Middle East, because of the quality of the Middle East oil, is mostly sweet oil, mostly light and medium crude oil, there is no change. In terms of climate ambition, it's important also to say that depending on the climate ambition, the stranded assets is less important than the revenue. It's not the integrated volume that can be produced, but the time that is important for the producing regions. 
if we have the climate ambition for the end of the century, the full history, some regions can produce more in the beginning and won't produce oil in the end of the century because of the negative emissions. We can have some bags, some first station compensating for this oil production in the beginning of the century. But we have, if we have the climate ambition related to the peak temperature, so we have to reduce the production today, we have to reduce the production after the mid-center, this region cannot produce oil. So for some regions, it's more important for, this, for the case of the oil rents, not the volume, the volume of oil that will be produced, but the time that is allowed to produce the oil. This is very important for rent seek regions for the emerging countries. And our model shows that because of the CDR, the carbon dioxide removal options in the model, some nature-based solutions, some technological-based solutions, mostly related to BACs, the oil can compensate for the, the model the, the model can compensate for some remaining oil production and this can allow some countries, some regions, staying producing the crude oil. Obviously, the oil production will vanish, but not so fastly and not so intensively as we see, for example, in the Net Zero report from the International Energy Agency because of this carbon dioxide removal option. In terms of refinery, some, some existing refiners will close. They are not prepared to process the remaining oil and they, they cannot, that these refiners cannot stay alive with these so tight margins for the refiners. But we need some greenfield refiners. Actually, there are some hard to abate sectors that stay alive in this climate scenario. We need jet fuel, we need bunker fuels up to the mid-century, we need NAFTA, we need petrochemicals. So we still need oil and we will still need some refiners. And the choice of the model is to invest in some greenfield refineries, mostly to process medium crudes with hydrocrackers. And we, then we have this question. By investing in these, these new refiners, what about the carbon lock-in? The carbon lock-in related to these greenfield refineries, these new refiners. Some refiners will close, some refineries, some new refiners will be invested. And then we start a kind of study to understand if the, there are carbon lock-in in the refinery sector for these greenfield refineries. And we are using here the study of Ericsson and other authors to quantify lock-in risks associated with investments in a greenfield refinery. We have here four parameters. Equipment lifetime, the lifetime of the oil refiner. Most of the oil refiners have a long lifetime to maturate the investment the overcommitted emissions, the emissions that will stay because of this investment, some bar barriers related to financial. So how can we replace some oil derivatives, some oil products with other fuels, other liquid fuels, the difference of price and cost be because of that, and some F effects, some carbon locking, related to the institutional, institutional barriers. Here we have the comparison between the oil refineries and other technologies, different technologies. And in yellow, we have the carbon locking because of these parameters, measure, measured by these parameters, comparing refineries with other energy technologies. And as you can see, for the lifetime, we have major, several life, uh, carbon locking related to refineries. For the financial barrier, depending on the oil product, 
the financial barrier can be higher or low. If you are talking about, for example, petrochemical naphtha, jet fuel, the financial barrier is very high. The cost of the CBC of the alternative is most very expensive compared to the oil product. But for the fuel oil, for also for the gasoline, there are other options that can be put in place. In terms of overcommitted emission, uh, for the ref reference scenario, there are a lot of expansion for the oil refineries. So oil refineries means an overcommitted emissions for the century. As final remarks, crude oil products production and processing are complex and relevant to be overlooked by integrated assessment models. We need to express the quality of the oil and the oil refineries. Incorporating oil quality leads to regional change in oil production. This is important for the South America countries because of the quality of some crudes, the Mexican crudes, the Venezuelan crudes, but not so much for Brazil. Brazil has now a medium sweet oil that is very, very suitable to produce jet fuel, for example, which is a very difficult fuel to be replaced. Oil quality matters affecting health crude supply that relies on revamps of refineries. So these are the losers in the term, in terms of our model. Greenfield refiners are still needed, mostly focused on hydrocrackers for medium distillates and or petrochemical naphtha. Actually, it's interesting to see that we have a material model in our integrated assessment model. And because of the energy transition, not only, but also because of the energy transition, there is an increasing demand for petrochemicals. So the energy transition, for example, replacing the fleet of the light vehicles means you need plastic, you need propene, you need ethene, so you need petrochemicals. And the biomaterials, the synthetic materials can be an option, but not for, for the mid-century. Carbon locking metrics show high value for the refinery sector when compared to other sector technologies. So there are carbon locking risks. Actually, we have a challenge. We have to expand refineries in order to deal with this demand for some hard to abate sectors. But then we have to close refineries. So it's a kind of challenge. Adaptation strategies for existing refineries exist. There are some technological options for refiners, uh, for example, co-processing and also integrating refiners with petrochemicals. So there are some strategies that can be put in place as of today, mostly to transform oil refiners as energy refineries, incorporating other feedstocks for petroleum refineries in order to have a smoothing carbon locking. Thank you, thank you all. So uh, we wanted to assess uh, the stranded asset case in the coal sector and in particular coal export uh, projects. Um, as you might know, there are still, and if you've read the uh, production gap report, um, you know there are a lot of uh, projects still um, in under development. And one famous one uh, is uh, the, or one famous so far rather untapped basin is the Galilei Basin in Australia. And um, we've looked at that particular case um, and looking at the Carmichael mine in the Galilei Basin. Um, so we wanted to know uh, if we assess that from an economic point of view, is there a case for the investment in this mine under different scenarios, obviously, um, or uh, can we somehow uh, yeah, consider there a stranded asset risk? Um, so we've done a rather, yeah, a, a model setup with uh, a coal sector model of the global coal market. Um, and uh, we've built a couple of long run scenarios with a particular focus on 
um, coal consuming countries that uh, import uh, uh, most of the Australian coal. Um, so that's that's China and, and uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan mostly. Um, and then we've added another node for the Galilei Basin, um, which so the, the model can then decide to invest or not. Um, here briefly, uh, the, the major Australian coal basins. And so what's there in, in greenish and, and uh, purple blue, that's like um, what's, what's already producing and existing. And what would be added is the Galilee Basin and the star there, the Carmichael mine, just to, to get an overview. So what you already see, uh, most of that is rather close to the coast. Um, it's all developed. So there's infrastructure to get coal to the ports, etc., to to uh, ship off to the Asian market. Um, not so much, or it's not the case uh, for the Galilee Basin, or was not the case. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in, in a second, as the Carmichael mine actually started to produce some coal uh, already. Um, but so we, we are kind of before that happened or, or blending that out for a moment. Um, so briefly, the model, uh, just showing an overview, uh, the model kind of represents about 90 to 95% of steam coal production consumption. So that's thermal coal excluding lignite, which is not transported over large distances. Um, it's a partial equilibrium setup, profit maximizing exporters and producers, um, which endogenously decide to invest in new capacities or not. And on the other hand, uh, capacities deplete over time due to um, like uh, factors of, of lifetime and uh, remaining reserves. And now the Galilee Basin is added as a new node without production capacity. And the model can decide invest or not, uh, depending on uh, this profit maximizing scheme. Um, and briefly, the scenarios. So we've came up with, with scenarios based on uh, coal plant level data, uh, coal plant uh, data provided by a global energy monitor. Um, and we decided to, to rather come up with our own uh, scenarios there to have more details on like actual consumers of that steam coal. So uh, in the high demand scenario, we, we take uh, this kind of conservative approach. Uh, coal plants run for about 40 years. Average capacity factors just continue and, and stay around 50%. And a moderate decline, that's kind of like a Glasgow uh, style scenario for the coal sector. And then we have a 1.5 uh, degree scenario based on IPCC numbers. Um, so yeah, if, if you have later questions, maybe afterwards. Um, so a brief overview on the global results and you see also in the high demand scenario, that's, that might be the interesting thing that also their coal production and consumption declines. Um, if you're familiar with the coal sector, it's nothing new, but China and India, that's like where most of the things happen, right? So they, they make up most of the consumption side there and it's only some some minor shifts there but uh, the concentration of all coal consumption but also production is uh, mostly in that asian region um, and now the interesting part um, for of the results um, so we've run that and we we used like the, uh, the cost uh, estimate ranges of all the data we found for the Carmichael mine and we used only like the, the most optimistic bottom uh, estimates for costs and uh, investment costs and we still don't see any investment um, in the Galilee Basin. One reason is that overall demand is so low. Um, in other uh, Australian regions, we also only see minor replacement investments of coal mines. So even in the high demand scenario, only minor investments in replacements in Queensland and New South Wales. So um, maybe also relevant for other regions than, than the Galilee Basin. And these results for the Galilee Basin are robust to another additional decrease of uh, cost estimates by 25% only. If we then decrease even lower, we have some initial investment. Um, so I already said um, demand is declining. That's uh, 
Australian domestic demand, but Galley Basin was meant and is meant to uh, like produce coal for export. So um, the Carmichael mine is, is apparently owned by the Adani. Um, it was supposed to deliver coal to India and, and ensure supply for India. Um, interestingly, from our model, uh, actually none of that coal from Australia would end up in India because India is supplied else by, by South Africa and etc. So um, Australian coal would mostly go to the Chinese market. Um, of course, that's cost optimal and, and um, profit maximizing. Um, politically, it's then in the end, of course, something else often, but just an impression. Um, interesting for the Australian case in general, exports in general decrease. So even in the high demand scenario, and that is, of course, now we have a different situation, um, but we have to keep in mind, this is a model that, that goes to up to 2050, that results are shown, it models until 2060. Um, and it looks at five year time steps. So if we think about those long run uh, investments, um, of course, it's now everyone is talking about, um, well, actually, it's uh, uh, very fortunate for uh, the Carmichael mine that it already started production because now it can profit from the high prices. But the other question is, will it ever recover any of like a major part of the initial investment? Because to look at that case, we've done um, some sensitivity analysis also based on comments from, from this crowd. Um, looking at the sunk investment case, we see that if so, uh, that set up just uh, the model can start to produce without having any investment cost um, in an initial 10 megaton, uh, 10 million ton per annum uh, capacity or 60. So we, we did both of that. We see that in a high demand scenario, yes, that is used. However, of, if we already start to go in a direction of a moderate decline scenario, um, even this for free capacity is not used all the way up. So even, even now, we, we have to consider continue investing in um, like making, making what's already there um, accessible or just uh yeah skip that right away no no use of it in a 1.5 degree scenario um yeah and uh, coming to a couple of final remarks um so particularly for that basin it's a poor coal quality a lot of investment in new infrastructure that's needed to get that coal out of there very limited and unsecured demand especially over the long run. Um, so substantial risk of stranding those assets, um, no security at all to recover all the, the, the money that's, that's went in there already. Um, and on a global perspective, kind of uh, taking the, the, the global view there, um, we see that only if like we see some limited additional investment still in a high demand scenario, but there's so much coal producing capacity out there already that um, if we go into a Glasgow direction, um, no more uh, additional coal mining capacity is needed. Um, and that's so the risk here from from that perspective is particularly high also for producers like South Africa, Colombia, Australia, Indonesia, that would invest in additional capacities for exports. As particular as we see like um, policies and incentives in China in, uh, and India to reduce um, or to increase their sufficiency of coal supply, domestic coal supply. So um, yeah, thank you. I'll stop there. Okay, uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm Steve Pye from University College London. Um, actually, it was meant to be Adrian Vogt-Schild from the Inter-American Development Bank presenting. So if you've come to Oxford wishing to see him, um, I'm afraid it's me. Um, but I will do my very best to sort of portray the sort of key messages uh, that he wanted to say and, and also to say that this is uh, very much a study that UCL was involved in. 
um, uh, for the Inter-American Development Bank. But I mean, the, the, the basis of the study was to look at, you know, how natural gas reserves and fiscal revenues uh, would play out um, under sort of more stringent climate policy using a, a, a modeling approach. And it follows from a study we also did on oil um, a couple of years ago, but this one's on gas. Right. Okay, so um, key thing is natural gas is extremely important for the region, accounts for at least 25% of, of energy consumption, really important, particularly for the power sector. And we've seen that recently with uh, gas coming in to fill the gap that hydropower has left with some recent drought years, particularly in Brazil. So really important um, energy uh, source uh, for, for power generation, but also an important um, energy uh, type in terms of government re revenue. So it has, a, it has a sort of large fiscal impact, um, particularly for selected countries. So not in the aggregate like oil does, but particularly for certain countries like Bolivia, Trinidad and Tobago, um, and Argentina to some extent, you know, government revenues from this sector um, are, are particularly important. So what we wanted to do was to, to basically look at the risks to investments and revenues from both climate policy coming in, uh, but also significant cost reductions across different technologies, particularly renewable um, energy uh, technologies. So uh, just a bit more context on terms of gas producers in um, Latin America and Caribbean. Um, so gas production is shown here. You could see a, a sort of peak in 2015 and then something of a decline to 2021. Um, but with uh, uh, an overall gas production being quite a significantly lower than oil, something like times uh, three times lower. But particularly big producers like um, Argentina and uh, uh, moving towards the unconventionals um, and also Trinidad and Tobago, which has a large export um, economy through LNG. And then some of the other big oil producers like Brazil, Mexico, uh, Venezuela, um, a lot of gas, particularly coming from associated gas from that uh, from that oil production. But that gives you a sort of sense of, of what the sort of natural gas picture looks like in the region. So, yeah, so what we were trying to do was to look at uh, prospects for natural gas production um, and consumption and the associated revenues from that under emerging climate regimes in uh, LAC. I'm going to use the short form for Latin American Caribbean. And how we did this was we used um, a scenario framework called XL XLRM, which many of you are probably familiar with um, from uh, the RAND uh, Corporation, um, particularly well described in, in, in Lempert's book in 2003. But the idea is that we're looking at performance metrics on the right hand side. Um, so in this instance, we're interested in gas production um, and tax revenues. Um, and to do that, we use a model uh, or a number of models, but the main model is a model called GapTap. And I should say that the modeling here is very much the work of my colleague, Dan Wellsby, who developed that model as part of his PhD. Um, and we're interested in what external factors at the bottom uh, mean for these performance metrics. So climate policy and the impact on demand in particular but also policy levers. So what can government do in terms of fiscal regimes to uh, sort of continue that uh, production um, going forward? I mean, can, can uh, fiscal regimes be made more attractive and adv advantageous uh, to keep production in play? Okay, just something very briefly on the modeling. So, so GAPTAP is, a, is the, the primary model used in the analysis. Uh, it's a geological and economic model of the global natural gas resources at a field level, um, looking at uh, you know, the range of, of factors that have impact the, the sort of project economics using kind of NPV um, type, uh, type analysis, but accounting for fiscal regimes as well. Um, so the way it works is something like um, contracts, long-term contracts get um, fulfilled. Um, domestic producers then look after their own domestic demand and then a spot market comes into play to meet the residual demand. And from that, we get a regional price 
uh, formation and we get some regional production level at, at the country level. Um, there's a couple of other inputs into this framework. So we need a regional demand to feed the model, and that comes from an integrated assessment model uh, called TMUCL, which gives us that, um, that regional demand level. And also we need to know something about associated gas contribution from oil production. So we use, uh, uh, we use some model called Buego, which is run using similar scenarios. Um, and I should name drop here, but the um, uh, creation of Christoph McLeod when he did his PhD. Um, so we're all working in a very tight uh, network here. Um, so that's kind of the, the sort of modeling framework that we used for this analysis. Um, just to show you something of the, um, the production um, on the, the left-hand side and the consumption that comes out of the TMUCL model, no surprises here, but you can see at the, at, uh, the, the blue trend line show the below two degrees Celsius production um, and consumption, um, whereas the red and black lines look at NDC and reference type um, scenarios. So you can see that obviously stringent climate policy obviously has a, an impact both on production um, and consumption in the region. And it's interesting also to say that the gas production um, is, doesn't exceed um, consumption significantly. I mean, there's not a lot of exports um, going outside uh, of the region and, and, so, and, and a limited amount of imports through LNG and, and, and pipelines into, into Mexico. Um, so that's the kind of general basic um, overview of the sort of integrated assessment modeling results that are feeding in. And then we can look at some of the sort of um, country level um, projections uh, from the GAPTAP model out to 2035. So just some selected countries here, Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela, Mexico. Hopefully you remember the colors, but uh, red and black uh, are the sort of NDC reference case and blue and green are the sort of climate policy cases. And you can see at the um, country level that, um, that obviously there's, a, there's quite a spread, particularly for Argentina, and that, that sort of reflects the sort of, um, you know, whether uh, in terms of um, how fast those sort of uh, unconventionals um, get, get exploited um, in, in that country. Um, the Brazil and Ven Venezuela and Mexico, Mexico cases are to some extent um, a factor in the sort of um, oil, oil production uh, profile as well. But I mean, the, the, key, the key point of this was to show the sort of difference in terms of um, production levels at the country level under, under climate policy and under reducing technology costs. One of the things that came out, which is also interesting, was that particularly in the climate policy cases, you can't see a lot of um, variation between the trend lines there. And that shows the limited impact of changing tax rates or, 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 or changing the fiscal regime in those countries because of the tightness of the climate policy um, constraint um, that was in play. Um, another sort of a key uh, conclusion of the analysis was that cumulative revenue take across the region uh, was between 25 to 100 billion uh, up to the period of 2035, excluding Venezuela for, for, for certain reasons um, that, that sort of skewed the analysis. Um, that basically with the climate policy in play, this revenue base drops considerably. So it's at the lower end of that 25 to 100 billion dollar number. The other thing to say is that we also looked at unextractable reserves, which vary significantly under a two degrees C um, uh, scenario. So that's what this table shows, the various ranges of unburnable reserves using a 3P reserve um, categorization. Um, you can see that some countries, it's, it's relatively robust. So for Trinidad and Tobago, it's an uh, unextractable reserve number of 7 to 8%, um, whereas for some of the other major producers, it's a lot higher. But the regional range is between the 40 to 50% of unextra unextractable reserves um, for the region. Okay, so I, as I see, I'm um, getting beyond 10 minutes, a, a quick summary of, of, of some of the key points that came out. Um, 
that the Inter-American Development Bank were very interested in. So governments should not bet on revenues from gas or oil based on our previous analysis. Uh, due to strengthening climate policy, but also technology shifts in terms of cost reductions. Um, exporting gas, except for those already in the game, is not a cost-effective strategy that can necessarily maintain gas production under those climate policy uh, constraints. And there's no real evidence that gas, in terms of our analysis, can be used as a transition fuel under ambitious uh, climate policy. Um, but it's interesting to look at the current reality, which sees gas sort of coming through as a key source, particularly for electricity generation in the absence of strong investment in renewables. Um, also, um, finance, energy and environment ministries, so this is a key thing for the bank, uh, need to work together to bring a just transition through internal things like internalizing risks in tax regimes, but also aligning investments to that longer term net zero goal. And also, um, finally, international funders who may be more inclined to support gas um, also need to start orientating support towards um, renewable energy projects and uh, grid capacity. OK, just to say there's some additional information there at the end uh, for more deeper um, reading of the topic. But thank you very much. OK, good morning. I'm Sarah from the uh, King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center based in, in Riyadh. And this morning, I have the tedious task of presenting a review paper, which is based on a collection of modeling papers. So this is a, a paper that I have been working on with my uh, previous colleague, Aisha, who is now with the Mideast Institute in Singapore. And we try to answer basically two questions. The first one is how much would it cost for the, probably the most focal and one of the most important regions for the energy transition, which is the Middle East oil exporters. And second, uh, what to do in case things get really serious and the transition is moving fast. So, as you know, this topic has been there for the last three, three decades since the first treaty of the UNFCCC, which is recognizing the uh, unique situation of fossil fuel producers and exporters and the fact that the transition should be global and that no one should be left behind and we have to consider all national uh, circumstances. Up to the latest IPCC report, again, highlighting the risk of a transition for these countries. This is, a, in, a, in a snapshot, why it seems as a factor of risk for the uh, oil exporters in the Middle East. Basically, it's the share in GDP and share in, uh, in revenue, in export revenue. And another aspect which is linked also to the stranded asset question that is the purpose of uh, this session and was discussed previously is the amount of reserves that these countries hold and especially the horizon um, over which they can keep producing oil in, in terms to sustain their, their development. So they have to solve for a, a tricky question, which is how to meet the local or domestic climate pledges while at the same time sustaining and keeping driving a significant rent, which is uh, important to continue their, their development. The factor of risk comes basically from the importing regions of uh, this fuel, China, Europe, India, Japan, South Korea, and the United States, which are the biggest markets or the biggest buyers of the Middle East oil. If they embark on their transition, we estimate that around 40%, there would be a for around 40% cut in oil imports coming from the Middle East oil exporters towards these, uh, these countries. So we have conducted a review to bridge this gap. A lot of the literature that is available focuses on uh, global models with a regional breakdown that is not really um, taken into consideration the national context. So we have conducted this review to, to see what are the elements of discrepancy across these modeling uh, frameworks and how to estimate the losses for the Middle East oil exporters and what is the quantity or what is the, um, the risk or the cost for these countries 
And finally, what to do? What are the mitigation strategies that these countries can adopt in order to also embark in a sustainable future? So this is basically an extensive review of the papers that we have uh, of, that we have reviewed, including um, two that I have uh, provided recently and were published recently for Saudi Arabia. Most of the literature focuses on global models with a regional breakdown. I will move directly to the conclusions of, of these papers. The estimates range between 1% and 4% of GDP in terms of economic losses for the Middle East oil exporters. This is the first key message. The second key message is that across all the uh, models that we have reviewed, most of them conclude that the Middle East oil exporters will bear the highest cost across all the other natures. So this is an important factor that should be considered and linked also to the question of, of equity and the question of just transition and the question of stranded assets. Another uh, thing is that models are, are models, so you have to account for a lot of uh, methodological approach, the assumptions that are used, the framework, the regional breakdown that is considered for these papers. And this is the key or the main factor of difference or divergence across these results that we have uh, that we have reviewed. Interestingly, two or three papers actually conclude, quite old, but the, the outcome is, is really interesting and worth highlighting, is that two or three actually find that the OPEC countries might end up gaining rather than losing if we embark in a fast transition, because they are first in the cost curve. We will still need significant amounts of, of fossil fuel and of oil and gas, which can lead to an overshoot in terms of of prices. There will be still volatility, but the prices will be uh, higher than, than in, a, um, in, a, in a normal uh, transition, which is will be orderly uh, synchronized across all countries, which will lead to a higher revenue for these countries rather than, than losses compared to a stringent climate policy uh, scenario. Now we move to the second uh, part, which is what to do. There are basically uh, a few key instruments or few tools that these countries might adopt in case to mitigate the losses on their on their economies. The problem is that for each for each one of these tools, you have a certain set of of challenges. They come with a pros and and cons. And for most of them, the uh, cons factors are much more or have much more or a higher weight than the than the pros one. Of course, you have. Uh, exchanges of experiences. Basically, it's just deriving what other countries adopted and try to implement them in the Middle East context, which is basically we cite often as the Norway experience, which cannot be basically translated or duplicated in the Middle East context. The second one is to have a unilateral action, which means just to implement our own policies and just not withdraw, but to not provide or give uh, big attention to what's going on in, in other countries. The third one is the uh, quota agreement across the uh, Middle East oil exporters, which is, again, hard to enforce. And the recent or the history of OPEC have, have proven that. The price war is not something that everyone is willing to, uh, to take. And a lot of countries might end up losing, given that they have small amounts of reserves, small amounts of production, small amounts of uh, of exports compared to the rest of, of countries. Requesting financial compensation is extremely hard to get, especially for, for these countries. And most of the indices that were submitted recently, the one for Saudi Arabia, for example, clearly mentions that it is not conditional to uh, receiving financial compensation. Economic diversification is the key highlight or the ultimate graal or, or strategy to, to adopt. And this one is the one that I will focus on in the next um, in the next slide. So in the next slide, um, here I'm providing just a highlight about economic diversification and how it is hard to, to implement and how it is hard to quantify. It is often cited as probably the best option for these countries. There is a wide agreement in the literature regarding, uh, regarding that. But finally, we found few case studies that are centered on 
um, on specific uh, countries. We have conducted recently an analysis for Saudi Arabia showing how economic diversification can be implemented and what can be achieved in order to um, offset the risk of uh, low oil price that will be generated through lower demand caused by the implementation of a stringent climate policy. There is another attempt for um, Kuwait as well, which highlights also the role of economic diversification, including some policy tools or policy instruments, such as reforming domestic uh, energy prices in the case of, uh, of Kuwait. Moving forward, we have identified four key research avenues. The first one is the regional breakdown. All of what have been presented before, except a few studies, are global integrated models with a regional breakdown. But once we start digging into the national context, the, the results can vary significantly across countries, even within the same region, such as the case of the Middle East uh, countries. The second one is we need to update and account for more stringent climate pledges, including uh, accounting for net zero scenarios in many of the oil importing uh, countries. Third is we don't have to be really uh, limited to a certain set of policies or tools. We have to consider all potential frameworks, including a higher role of carbon capture and storage, which is mentioned in the this is my 10 minutes. It's done. It's the last one. <laughs> Such as the framework that was presented and adopted recently, um, considering the concept of the circular carbon economy, which accounts for the national circumstances of oil exporting countries. The third one, or the fourth one and last one, is to account for a higher role of technology and finance. So those are the, 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 the key two gap in terms of analyzing the cost of transition for these uh, for these countries there is a huge gap missing in analyzing the role of technology upgrading technology and the role of finance which mostly focused for these two tools on developed countries rather than than developing and emerging uh, countries especially for oil uh, exporters that's it thank you Thank you very much, Salah. Well, we have some 22, 23 minutes left, so let's open for questions now. I would like to ask you to be short in your questions so that you can have more questions being raised and respond. You can go first, please. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Steve. Um, I think this is really fascinating work. Of course, oh, thank you. Is this, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I've got a question for Steve. Um, so my question is, in the past as well, you've done this research on how, how much of those fossil fuel reserves have to stay in the ground and where. And my question to you is, with this type of research, do you reach policymakers, politicians, governments in those countries where you say X amount of fossil fuel reserves have to remain in the ground? And what are their reactions to this? Because you were talking about Trinidad and Tobago, for example, they have to leave 8% of their gas reserves in the ground, if you go to the government there, how would they respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a political scientist. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sorry, Steve, go, yeah, go, yeah, you go, yes, let's be fast and then we can move and then you, I move to you. Yeah, Mathieu, thank you yes. very much thank for the um, for the question. I mean, I, I mean, to be honest, I haven't been um, involved in those discussions, um, but I think it's a really it's a really interesting question. And what is interesting about the analysis is this kind of diversity in terms of what countries and the ranges um, or how they're impacted essentially, in terms of the sort of range that that so called has to stay in the ground. Yeah, I mean. Trinidad and Tobago, I'm sure they'd be quite happy with the results. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a, it's a it's an interesting um, starting point for a discussion, just to particularly at the regional level to sort of start to sort of open up that that those questions about 
you know, what is the, what does the dependency look like on this um, industry? Um, and how might this play out in the future? You know, is, is it going to be a climate policy focused future or is it going to be one that is on a sort of NDC trajectory? But I think showing that level of, of uncertainty, um, showing what the impact could be, I think is a, is a useful starting point. But to be honest, I don't know how it's landed. Um, and that's where Adrian would have been a much better panelist than me. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question. Thank you, Alexandre, very briefly, and then we have five questions already, and then we're going to stop, okay? Let's just say something from someone from Brazil and from South America, maybe. Uh, I think there are two major responses for your question. Some governments will try to anticipate the rent, so to anticipate the production or the auctioning for the blocks. I don't know what in Dr. Tobago, but Brazil and other countries, maybe they will anticipate. It's not the question of the volume, but to anticipate the revenues is a kind of green paradox. And maybe other countries will also, these are another possibility, another alternative, they will pledge for some criteria, for allocation criteria, some equity criteria. So they will pledge that they may be allowed to produce more oil and gas because of they will, they have to have this revenue. So I think there are the two responses in the region for that. Thank you, Alexandre. You, and then we have three on the front here. Please go ahead with your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Greg Lotz, Australian National University. Uh, question for Salah Hedin. I think you said um, your review shows GDP cost of three to four percent, or in the, in that region. Um, I would I would put to you just as a proposition that that's actually quite moderate for the you know fundamental restructuring of the resource sector of oil rich countries, and that uh, perhaps the emphasis should be on how to um, compensate that through productivity gains uh, in in fact economic uh, diversification, and perhaps we can see three to four percent GDP costs as uh, somewhat good news if that's in fact what what the research shows yes please go ahead thank you just to address this yeah, yeah. Uh, very briefly yeah one to four might might seem quite moderate but this is due to two factors using the uh, real GDP is a quite rigid measure once we move to the exports or the rent itself the uh, the percentage percentage change is is quite higher than than this and second, it's again due to this aggregation of all the countries into one, one region, and we do not account for the disparity. And a cost is a cost, and it, it should be perceived as, as such. And of course, there are many ways to, to mitigate the, the losses. And this, uh, this is the second part and the most exciting and most challenging part of our work is to look for solutions that will not harm the exporters and the importers. Thank you, Salah. We have three questions here in the front. One, yeah, you're, you first, and then here in the front. And let's see then if we have time for more. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Brendan Devlin from the European Commission. Uh, I've actually done what you asked, uh, uh, gone to states and said you need to keep things in the ground, and we have had some reactions. Not, <laughs> <laughs> not, not for public use uh, yet. Um, but uh, I wanted to challenge you on some of the fundamental terms that you use, because, for example, uh, Saladin uh, uses the phrase that uh, keeping things in the ground and meeting climate targets is, is classified as an economic loss. That, that's a, a rather strange um, uh, 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 use of terms for something which um, has planetary significance. Uh, and uh, also, in using the word stranded asset, uh, I think you rather presuppose the case for getting these things out the ground. Stranded asset is used by energy companies to the European Commission as foregone profits. And uh, all of these terms lead through in general ways to um, uh, legal challenges under, for example, the Energy Charter um, uh, um, Treaty, uh, and in other ways to these claims that uh, the European Union or the Paris Agreement states are somehow taking things which uh, are properly the uh, property of, of countries, when in fact we are just doing something to maintain planetary stability. So I would ask the, all the panel, 
Could you think of some other terms to use which does not presuppose that we're going to wreck the planet? Thank you for the questions. <laughs> I don't know who wants to start. Steve, do you like to start? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Just because I, I saw you taking some notes. Yeah. That's fine. So I, I, yeah, I saw very, you preparing yourself notes, for that. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I think it's a it's a good point. I mean, I, I'm slightly uncomfortable with the term stranded asset, and I can't remember how many times I used it in the presentation. But I mean, what we're looking at is is projections of uh, what the what the reserve value might be uh, going forward under a range of different scenarios. And I think for the purposes of that, it, it it's a it's a useful exercise just to highlight point that um, governments, you know, basically can't bank on um, having that, ha having those reserves um, going forward and, and the revenues that flow from them. So I don't know if, if kind of prospective stranded value might be a might be a better terminology. I don't know, but um, no value. Okay, fine. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Allah? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, yeah, on the use of stranded assets, I remember that we had this discussion with uh, with Christopher several years ago when he first um, presented a version of of his paper. And basically, there is no consensus still on the use and what is the um, best approach to look at stranded assets. Um, on the use of the term loss, I s still believe that this is more or less an accurate term, especially for if we take into account the national uh, circumstances. Um, this is again compared to a business as usual or a reference scenario. That's why we refer to this as, as, as potential losses. But foregone revenue is a term that I personally prefer and I tend to use rather than, than, than losses. But in comparing two business plans, one with generating higher sales or higher rent and one with a lower uh, rent, this is a potential loss for, 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 for these countries. Yeah. Thank you. Alexandre? It was a tough question. Um, I do fully agree with you when you talk about resources because actually they are in ground and maybe the best word is unburnable resources. That was used for Steve and we tried to use it to but for the case of the assets, for the refineries, for example, I think we have a strong message for the financial sector by using stranded assets. We have this experience, for example, in Brazil, talking to the financial sector in Brazil and the stranded assets is a strong message to not finance this type of investment of companies. So I think the stranded assets for the companies and for the financial sector is a strong message. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, it's great. Uh, we had that discussion a lot and, and I, I was very hesitant to, to call also in the, especially in the coal sector, stranded assets. And another work that's kind of related to that, just for the coal sector now, we see um, kind of not recovered overnight investment costs for infrastructure is one thing and that's rather small um compared to like um socioeconomic effects and the risk of uh unstructured transition so um it's really it's it, and i would agree if we if we target like like um, maybe a, a peer group and and that's going towards investments etc something like uh, investment risk or something so it's it's not the so it's a risk for investors if they continue investing that, but it's uh, not a claim that it should be compensated because someone we know since 50 years. So since the 70s, it's out. So who still continues to invest? Um, it's I mean, they have to consider that risk, right? Um, but then um, a reframing in the other end towards like politicians should be going towards um, so what's actually the risk for society if we continue to stick to that model and then have a chaotic changes happening uh, once maybe um, Global North is not importing as much oil or coal anymore. 
and then local communities are left to well whatever is left but no revenues thanks thank you well we have 10 minutes left so let me collect the three questions here on the front and then if i have time we go back here on the front please let's see if we can get there no no this side here i think we have to, yeah Okay, thank you. My name is Max Arma from Lund University. I have a question to Saladin. Uh, I agree that economic diversification is perhaps I mean, the one road to go for these uh, oil producing producer economies, but economic diversification also usually comes with quite big political risks if you're going to do it. Do you have any comments of that actually might be a more difficult problem than the loss of income and rent, actually the political tensions in these countries. Let me collect the next, next question, please, and then you go here. Okay, please, go ahead. Yeah, so this is for Alexander, and I was thinking about um, how changing of the refinery output portfolio changes sort of the costs. So if you reduce the um, demand for transport fuels, road transport fuels, for example, that, then I'm thinking that a larger share of the cost of the oil will have to be uh, covered by the remainder of the products, the petrochemicals and stuff like that. Have you looked at sort of what the, how, how this changing the, in the oil market and refinery uh, portfolio changes the cost of the final products? Thank you. Yes. Was that my question? So um, my question was then also to Salah, in terms of um, a lot of what we're talking about here is about policy action and, and it builds on the question around losses. So from policy action, but actually if we look at the energy transition becoming more inevitable from the role of new technology and the role of rollout of new technology sources, would you still use the same kind of loss phrases and sort of look for um, recompense if you like from the wider community where in fact it's becoming increasingly technology driven? So I suppose that was just a kind of quite a broad question. There. Thank you. Let's go to response, and then if we have time, we collect more questions. Please, uh, I think the first one here it was to, uh, to me. To Sarah. Yes, yeah, Sarah, you have two questions, then Alishan one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, about the the policy policy tools or policy side of this, I unfortunately do not have a clear answer. Um, coming from a more or less purely quantitative background, but we try to capture this in our models through the uh, fiscal uh, reforms, energy prices reforms, energy efficiency measures. And this is purely directed in a, in a, in a modeling framework, but we do provide some, some insights based on international experiences on how to move with, with, with uh, subsidies, removal, with the uh, taxation uh, reforms. And basically we, we argue that this is the best way to go if we would like to be not completely independent, but lower our reliance on, on, on fossil fuel, which if we have that, that perception, yeah, it will be perceived as, as loss rather than, than opportunity for, for, uh, for transition. So we do touch upon some of the policy uh, instruments, but we do not go that deep in our, in our, uh, in our analysis, unfortunately. Ala, can you go directly to your second question? Yeah, so the second question is regarding technology, right? Yeah, I mean, so basically, rather than looking for international governments from a policy perspective to recognize the loss, it'd be more, say, we start, with, should, should Middle East and other fossil fuel exporters start looking to uh, Volkswagen or Ford or other um, electric vehicle manufacturers, for, as an example, for sort of um, recognize the loss? Yes. So, as I said previously, the question of compensation is is quite is quite tricky. And from from an oil exporter uh, perspective, this is something that we believe is really hard to enforce. And as I mentioned previously, it's clearly stated in in the national climate policy program that it's not conditional to receiving uh, international uh, finance, but rather into receiving help and assistance in implementing uh, technological uh, tools. We have CCS green hydrogen as very important and key pillars to support our uh, national transition. So those are two key factors that we are focusing on. And of course, they are um, technology, technology heavy. And in, 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 in the kingdom, there is now one of the largest green hydrogen um, uh, sites that will be uh, coming online, I think, within the next few years. As, long, as as well as 
probably two or three of the largest CCS plants, which will help um, support the transition of, of the kingdom as um, a global oil supplier and a key actor in terms of advancing the climate policy agenda. Thank you, Alexandre. Um, I think we, we, uh, we need to see the least cost optimization results with some caution. It shows a trend, but actually for these ambitious scenarios, for this climate ambitious scenarios, the oil prices are moderate. So we have a challenging situation because we need to invest in some oil refineries, in the retrofit of some oil refineries or in the repurposes of some oil refineries, but with moderate oil prices. I think now we have a interesting situation as of today because the refineries margins are very high. I don't know if you know that, but refineries margins as of today because of, of, of Russia invasion of Ukraine and also the recovery after, after COVID, the refineries margins are $40 per barrel. Very high. In the history of the refineries, these are very, very, very high. But there are no investments as of today, no big, no large investments as of today in greenfield refiners, only 2 million barrels per day and 1 million barrel per day of greenfield refiners integrated with petrochemical in China. And this other major refinery in Nigeria that is being somehow um, delayed. This means that the transition and the, the fear of stranded assets, if I can say that, is delaying the investment in oil refiners, is already impacting the investment in oil refiners. There are no major investment. So the result of our model is a very challenging result because we need some few investment, but the margin will be low. And this means that maybe there are possibilities of the, a difficult transition, some price volatility related to some fuels that are needed during the transition and then get, that are not so, that are hardly replaced. NAFTA, that fuel, as I told you before, and also diesel, maybe diesel too. Thank you, Alexandre. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions. So one here. One there, and I think the lady there. You, have, you should have higher hands. <laughs> to see. So you, let's start with you. <laughs> and that's it. That's it. Um, my question is for Alexandra. Um, I'm, my name is Kathy Harrison. I'm from the University of British Columbia. I am particularly interested in, in hearing more about the division between Canada and the U.S., which were lumped together. Um, but maybe that's something for offline. But one of the things I'm also struck by is um, the role of investments in CCF, especially for some of the high carbon intensive oils. When you're modeling it, how do you take into account the fact that governments are now significantly subsidizing that and thus making some of those um, lower quality crude oils more price competitive than they would be otherwise? Thank you. Then let me collect your question here, here on the front. Just, just raise your hand so that he can see where you are. Thanks. Kiel Kühne from the Leave it in the Ground initiative. I'm very happy to see the engaged uh, discussion with Salah because at a previous conference I said let's get more people from the Middle East here. And um, so I have another question for you. And that is I like the way how you uh, look at both sides, you know, the pros and the cons. And I'm wondering um, in the sense of um, the reframing that Brandon called for, um, if we call these things risky bets, you know, you bet on something, you invest money, and you may get a return on it. Um, there also there 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 is a benefit in earning money, but there is also a downside, and um, those are the climate costs. You know, there is death and damage associated with fossil fuels, and colleagues have uh, quantified that. You may have seen the mortality cost of carbon, which means for each 4,400 tons of carbon, you get one dead 
human being. And um, the climate costs, it's about $420 uh, dollars per ton, and that translates into $175 of damages per barrel of oil. So those are distributed around the world, but in Saudi Arabia, it's 20. So for each barrel of oil that you extract, you get $20 of damages in Saudi Arabia. Um, over the course of the century. So I wonder if you have been looking at these downsides. We've also had the news of five degrees warming in the in, in, the, in the region over the course of the century, which will, I, I'm sure, be very hard to bear. So I'm wondering whether these climate damages are, um, you're also putting them on the scale in, um, in the models in maybe costing them in, and if that changes the picture. Thank you. I think, I think we have one final question somewhere in here. Oh, yeah, yes, and that's done, and then we move to the, to the presenters. Thank you. Patricio Calles from SCI Latin America. I was just wondering your pers about your perspectives on reserve ownership, because especially with the um, Middle East and Latin America, um, a lot of the policy outputs that we would like would be aimed at uh, national governments, but not all reserves are owned by national governments, especially Trinidad and Tobago. When you talk about Trinidad and Tobago exporting, it's actually shale exporting out of Trinidad and Tobago. And so, I mean, and governments own most of the conventional resources, so not marginal resources, probably lower cost and stuff like that. So I was wondering whether making a distinction between the kind of oil that's likely to continue to be produced by, by state-owned enterprises and, and national governments um, faces a different challenge than international oil and companies and majors that have very clear avenues and might just shut up, shut off production uh, rather quickly in these regions. Thank you. So let's go to Alexandre first, Allah, and then for the final question, I don't know who wants to answer. Alexandre. So thank you for the question. And I'm sorry for putting together USA and Canada. <laughs> Actually, we have results for both countries. Um, first of all, there is the possibility for CCS in the oil production. Actually, Brazil is already doing CCS in the case of the Brazilian oil, oil production offshore because of the CO2 in the natural gas associated production. But I show you the results for a scenario related to the 1.5 degree. And therefore, I think there is no space more for the CCS in the half crude production because of the price. First of all, we have a moderate oil price. So for this moderate oil price, the cost of the CCS will impact the competitiveness of these half crudes. So this is a major problem. And also, if you have these half crudes going to refineries, you have to revamp the refineries, invest in existing refineries. But the refineries are, some, some of the refineries are stranded assets. So in our results for the 1.5 degree scenario, CCS goes to the biomass conversion. We need some negative emissions. So there are some CCS, for example, in the ethanol production. This is a easily captured CO2 from the fermentation of the glucose. So this is easily captured. And there are some CCS in terms of advanced biofuel production. So fissure tropper synthesis and so on. But this comes because we need negative emissions for compensating the emissions that are still uh, exist, existing because of some fossil fuel production. Thank you, Alexandre. Ala? Thank you. Um, that's a very good question. And of course, it's, it's a risky bet. Uh, as you know, the Middle East is one of the regions that would be hardly hit by extreme weather um, in case we, we, we advance in the uh, um, climate, um, unfortunately, climate, climate change. But again, this is a risky bet from a, a purely, let's say, business perspective. If we look at it also from a, a social perspective, and this is an excellent point that was that was raised, social considerations should be also um, should be also considered. One of the key issues is, of course, current emission levels, but also historical emissions. But now moving forward, uh, we can focus on solutions. And one of the optimal solutions is to expand on, on CCS. It will 
strike the right balance between the interests of consumers and the interests of producers and exporters. And I don't think that now we are doing uh, pretty well in terms of expanding on the solutions aside rather than just pointing what, what is the, the, the problem. CCS and hydrogen can be really a big breakthrough in, in, in having all these uh, spectrum covered social, economic, a just transition, equity, and so on. So I think that rather than having a pure focus on perceiving things at, as a risky bet, we can focus on on solutions and what what could be the key enablers to protect the interests of, of everyone, not only the, the energy consumers, but also the energy producers and exporters. Thank you, Ala. I don't know if Steve or Kristen want to address the final question. Sure. No, I can I can go for that. No, I mean I think it's a it's a great point in terms of ownership um, on on reserves, and I think quite useful actually to make the distinction between NOCs and and IOCs due to the you know the different strategies that might be in play. I mean certainly the modelling we did, um, we do have the ability to sort of make those distinctions and pull those out. I think it would be interesting to do that and then to think about the sort of different. Um, incentives or disincentives that are needed across those two quite distinctive um, sets of sets of owners. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Christian, you want to say something? You don't need to, just. <laughs> well, I'm not an expert on, on oil, but uh, it's certainly, I guess, for all fossil fuels, uh, one question about the uh, reserves. Um, so, uh, it might be also uh, if you look at at it the other way around um, that you in the coal sector you don't have a lot of reserves in uh, private hands in that sense um, which might make it easier if governments are committed to keeping those reserves in the ground um, it's really not much about compensating um, private companies that have earned the right somehow to to extract already so um, as one leverage point, maybe in the coal sector to um, to look at. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Christian. So, with that, we, we end the session here. Thank you very much for all the presenters, all questions, and we are six minutes late. But I did did on did that on purpose, so to avoiding crowding too much at the, the line for the food. So <laughs> now I think everything is going to be okay. Thank you very much.